Welcome back, everybody. My name is uh, Phil Muirhead. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at Boston University, and I'll be chairing this session. We have uh, two hours and five minutes of talks on fundamental properties of cool stars for you, so everyone get comfortable. Um, before we get started, I want to say, I want to iterate, reiterate what a lot of people have said at this meeting. Um, cool Stars 14 was my first meeting when I was a first year graduate student in Pasadena in 2006. I was absolutely terrified of asking questions, but I hope now um, the junior researchers in the audience are less terrified than I am, and in the question and answer session, we've tried to allot a lot of time for this. I'm hoping we get a number of questions from our junior researchers. Um, so to get started, uh, our first talk in this session is an invited, um, invited review talk by Ricardo Schiavon, and he is going to talk about um, Apogee, the uh, Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment. Ricardo, please. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So good morning, everyone. Oh, gee, this is this is very loud. Okay, good, good. So um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to be here speaking today at this prestigious conference. I'm going to be talking today about Apogee, the Apache Point Observatory uh, Galactic uh, ex Evolution Experiment. Uh, if you want to explore further into the details of uh, both the science goals and the, um, and the technical details of the survey, I recommend that you take a look at this publication. It's the overview paper written up by uh, myself and, and, and Steve Majewski and uh, loads of other people. Steve Majewski was the PI of Apogee, is the PI of Apogee. Right, so Apogee was conceived uh, with the idea of applying the Sloan philosophy of obtaining massive amounts of spectroscopic data uh, obtained with the same instrument, reduced with the same software, with well understood uh, systematics, well calibrated data, to uh, detailed abundance analysis. So it's a, it's a dual hemisphere spectroscopic survey of uh, uh, Milky Way stellar populations based in the infrared H-band. It's a high resolution survey, uh, resolution of about 23,000. It's, uh, it's dual hemisphere, and you know, one component is at Apache Point Observatory, the 2.5 meters long telescope. The other one is uh, the 2.5 meter DuPont telescope in Las Campanas, and uh, uh, a twin spectrograph uh, built and uh, 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 assembled at the University of Virginia. Um, so, I could go over the details here, but uh, uh, you, you, you know, you, you happy to, I'm happy to offer you the slides to look at then, and you also have all the publication about these details. The important thing I want you to keep in mind tonight, after dinner, if you think about Apogee, there are three things that make Apogee shine. Number one, high resolution. High resolution makes possible the kind of abundance analysis detailed abundance analysis that has characterized this field of uh, galactic uh, uh, archaeology for decades, only for a massive sample of half a million stars, giant stars. Half a million is important because that's, this way you can sample in a statistically meaningful fashion, hopefully, all the, the, the bins in multi-parameter chrono chemo kinematic space that characterize the stellar population of the galaxy. Giants, important because of volume. They are intrinsically bright. And of course, near infrared. I never cease to show these slides, you know, just to highlight the fact that everybody knows that the infrared allows you to see the inner, the, the inner galaxy and the low latitude components of the galaxy much better than in the optical due to its ability to pierce through extinction. Um, so this is the, the footprint of Apogee 1, where, uh, where we try to sample all the, the components of the galaxy, lots of halo pointings, disk pointings, bulge, and here is the, the, the Kepler field, which uh, is going to uh, appear later in this talk. Um, Apogee 1 was based only at Apache Point, which is why, why you have this major gap here in the south which is being filled now by, by, now by Apogee 2, which includes LCO, uh, uh, the Las Campanas Observatory component. And of course, like sampling again, 
lots of halo, you know, lots of substructure in the halo. The, all, all the news are the inclusion of uh, uh, Magellanic clouds and other uh, dwarf galaxies. And this slide doesn't represent entirely the, the halo sampling because there's lots and lots of pointings where we share the, the, the field of view with the manga survey. In that case, we have no control over the pointings, but we still get lots of uh, data in the halo. Right, so one of the important things about making this simple is to uh, uh, use a simple target selection criterion. And in our case, it's just a color cut. We take stars rather than, um, than a given uh, um, a limit, j minus q of 0.5. This is the main G sample. Of course, there are ancillary programs and subsamples where we explore deeper here or do different things there. And, but, but the main sample consists of very, very simple uh, 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 color cut, which makes modeling the selection function, while still a challenging task, much more easy than if we had like, you know, make a, made a more complicated uh, uh, selection criteria. Right, so the focus of this talk, however, is going to be the Apogee scientific footprint. Apogee, by design, covers a whole range of, galactic, uh, of astrophysics problems. Galactic archaeology, local group galaxies, stars, AGB stars, RR Lyra stars, binary stars, M dwarfs, and so on. Lots there. Stellar clusters, open clusters, globular clusters, interstellar mediums, substellar companions, and, uh, and spectral analysis, where we believe we innovated as well. However, in the interest of time, I'll have to sacrifice a lot of those topics, a, a vast range of very interesting astrophysics problems, which I'm happy to talk to you about uh, over a coffee or a beer. Um, now, um, I'm going to focus on the core mission of Apogee, which is galactic archaeology, and I'm going to talk about the galactic disk, bulge, and halo separately. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about stars, focusing on M dwarfs, because M dwarfs are, 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 are important for the, the crowd here, and then talk a little bit as well about spectral analysis. Um, and uh, I'm going to abuse a little bit my prerogative as speaker and mention some of the contributions that uh, uh, our group in, in Liverpool has been making to this field. So, the remit of galactic archaeology can be broadly summarized by these three questions. What is the current structure of the galaxy? And I, I quote uh, structure here because this is just not spatial structure. It is structure in multi-parameter space, uh, kinematics, uh, spatial structure, and chemistry, and age. Once you have been able to determine that, the next obvious question is what was the history leading to that structure? What's the physics behind that structure? What led the galaxy to be what we see today? And finally, what does that latter question, or those two questions, teach us about galaxy formation with uh, uh, lowercase g? Which is, of course, one of the most important topics in modern cosmology. However, we can only address this latter question, which is a very important question, if we can say that the Milky Way is a typical galaxy, and we don't know the answer to that question. It's a very important question. Since Copernicus, we've been making an effort to dissociate ourselves from a position of any, from any special position in the universe. But we, we don't really know the answer to that question yet. And uh, I will try to uh, uh, throw a few hints about what Apogee combined with state-of-the-art numerical simulations can, uh, can, can, can tell us about this question. It's very important that we also keep in mind the, the, the confluence of these massive surveys of the galaxy, Apogee is just one of them, with the uh, outstanding progress in numerical simulations that allow us to make meaningful comparisons of detailed data that we get for the galaxy with uh, 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 simulated galaxies. Right, so let's jump straight to the disk, the galactic disk. Contains, I think, 85% of the stellar mass of the, of the galaxy. Very important. It's been known for, for several years now that if you plot alpha elements over iron against metallicity, you have this bimodal distribution of stars in this plane. This is a very famous uh, uh, plane. 
So what you see here is like uh, uh, the, the stars that are deemed to be thick disk. They are older, and these are thin disk stars. There is this knee here in this relation. This is the thigh and the, and the shin. This is the knee. The presence of this knee here tells you that this system has undergone a coherent history of star formation, where initially it was enriched by supernova type 2 predominantly. And eventually, when supernova type 1a, which contributes a lot of iron, started contributing relevantly, this, uh, uh, this, uh, really, this sequence goes down. Okay? Whereas the thin disk has been, uh, um, has been characterized forever for a higher contribution uh, of uh, supernova type 1a relative to supernova type 2. Now, this is very hard to explain. So to, to have, uh, uh, for us to have, at the same Fion age, stars with different uh, uh, alpha enhancements is very difficult. And chemical evolution models have tried to do that. And the, the mode of operation in this field has been for a long time to reverse engineer the data using the laws of chemical evolution and adopting a star formation rate, adopting inflows, outflows with free parameters uh, uh, in order to try to see what combination of those parameters will generate what you saw there. But they do that with various degrees of, uh, of success or failure. This is, a, this is well summarized by uh, Andrews et al. in 2017. This is the two infall model that proposes that there's a first infall moment, and then there's a, a cessation of star formation, and then another infall, uh, all, of course, uh, uh, very ad hoc, and uh, uh, has trouble you know, basically doing what, what is needed there. And, uh, uh, and the other one is uh, uh, one where you, pr you propose that the high alpha stars are formed in the inner galaxy, the low alpha stars in the outer galaxy, and radio mixing brings them at the same location uh, in the solar neighborhood. Now, when you look at the apogee data, then, the situation becomes very complicated. Because if you have to do any tunings to explain the solar neighborhood, now you have to do tuning for all these beams here. So this is alpha over iron against iron for uh, beams, radial beams in this direction and, and the uh, distance from the galactic plane in this direction. I challenge you to find two beams here where the distributions are the same. It just doesn't happen. So uh, we have to do a different approach in order to, uh, to, to solve this problem. So at LJMU, my student Ted Macrath has been working on this. And we use the ego simulations, which we show that do generate these, uh, um, these bimodal distributions. You can see here for constant Fion age, you do see uh, uh, stars with different alpha per iron without necessarily any assumptions, right? So, um, so how does that happen? First, a brief word about the ego simulations. I am not a numerical simulator, as you might tell. So I'll just give you the, the most important details here. So it's a cosmological uh, simulation. Starts with a, it's, the volume is a, a 100 uh, uh, megaparsecs cube. Um, um, it, uh, 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 it has a state-of-the-art uh, uh, um, subgrid physics where the feedback is adjusted to match the observations, uh, but it does do uh, um, a, a, a careful chemical evolution uh, 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 modeling. Again, at the subgrid physics level. And uh, 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 the nice thing is because it's such a large volume, we have a large sample to play with. OK, so very quickly to the result. So what you see here is, again, the same, the same plane. This is a simulated galaxy. And what we do is we, we, uh, we study how, what is the evolution of the gas that leads to these stars in these two different positions on the plane. And this evolution is detached. They never talk together. Therefore, there is no need to come up with procedures, with, 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 uh, with machinations, to make, once you form these stars that are older, to then form these ones from the gas that's ejected from those uh, high alpha stars uh, uh, to form the low alpha stars. There's no need for that. They evolve in complete chemical separation. Uh, 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 and so in this plot here shows you, so this is the evolution, right, of the gas. And this plot here shows you the, 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 the maximum radius and at every uh, cosmic time that these two populations, these two boxes reach. And you see they are detached completely. They never talk to each other. First result. Second result, only six out of 133 galaxies in this cube 
have, uh, um, have this bimodal alpha distribution. Six out of 123, 5%. Very small, very small fraction. Suggests that the Milky Way, if the simulations are right, is rare. In fact, when we, we, when we studied what caused uh, uh, this difference between these six galaxies over the rest, what we found was that this is the accretion history. So this is a mass within a given radius, right? That's a function of time. The accretion history of these bimodal galaxies undergoes a, a, a rapid uh, accretion phase uh, at about zero, between one and two. That's the difference. So the Milky Way may have experienced then, if again, the simulations are right, a rapid accretion phase at those times, about uh, uh, eight, uh, 80 years ago. OK. What do other abundances tell us about the disk, though? So uh, in a very insightful paper, Thomas Masseron and Jerry Gilmer from Cambridge looked at the abundances of carbon and nitrogen in a sample of apogee stars. Uh, 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 and here what you see is like alpha, the same plot again, alpha against iron. They call this thick disk. They call this thin disk. I don't really like that because, because of reasons that we can discuss later. Uh, uh, but then if you look at the carbon over nitrogen ratio of these populations, right, it's very different. So the, 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 the thick disk stars, the high alpha stars, have larger uh, carbon over nitrogen than uh, the low alpha stars. So, Carbon over nitrogen is determined by a combination of stellar evolution, chemical evolution, and stellar mass. Right, so, as, uh, uh, so if, if, if mass can lead to age, if you know the, uh, the spectroscopic parameters, as Saskia has explained to us. So I don't need to go over that. Sa Saskia has uh, done the job for us. Now, uh, um, we have a sample of stars from the Kepler field for which we know the masses because they are astero-seismological uh, astero targets. We know the masses, we know the ages, we fit the relationship between age and carbon over nitrogen, apply that relation to a very large sample of Milky Way stars, 52,000 stars. And then you see here how beautiful this plot is. Uh, this is uh, you see that the thick disk stars, the high alpha stars really are older. There is an interesting age metallicity relationship here in the, in, the, in the thin disk, which we can discuss later. And this is a plot showing the distribution of stars in the focal plane, or so in the, in the galaxy plane, in the Z plane against a, a galactic radius uh, uh, um, plane, which of course is heavily uh, uh, biased by the selection function of apogee. If you want to know what happens when you account for that selection function, you ask me about that after uh, the, the talk, at the end of the talk. So, right, so now, Jump to the bulge. The bulge is interesting because, obviously, it's a, it's a galactic component that is very hard to understand, very hard to model, very hard to, to observe. And so we have a, a fairly large sample in the bulge, several thousand stars. It's a plot here. This plot here shows a, 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 the first foray into doing multiple abundances uh, for the bulge, like 15 stars in the in, uh, 15 abundances, 15 diameter abundances in the in body's window. And this here is just uh, shows a, a, a distrib the distribution of stars of different metallicities uh, uh, in, the, in, in 3D. So uh, we'll have to jump quickly here. You can come, we can come back to that later. So if you have several thousand stars in the bulge, you can discover fringe populations that can tell us something interesting about the formation of the galaxy. So and on the left panel here, you see nitrogen over iron against carbon over iron. This is the bulge field, and this is, uh, these, these stars here are highlighted. They, have, they are characterized by a high nitrogen abundance and an anti-correlation between nitrogen and carbon, a feature this is, that is well known from studies of globular clusters, which you can see here in the bottom panel. These are globular cluster populations. OK, so uh, the interpretation of this result is that we have, of the order of 10 to the 8 solar masses, if you work out the numbers, of destroyed globular clusters, stellar mass, uh, in, within two kiloparsecs of the, of, the, of the galactic center. This consists of a population that has been completely destroyed because the MDF of this population, which you see here, does not match the MDF of the galactic globular cluster system. This mass is six to eight solar masses, uh, six, to eight, six to eight times the mass of the existing globular cluster system. The existing globular cluster system is but a trace of what there was. Now, why is that interesting? Well, globular clusters are the one population that, that can tell you the total mass, dark matter plus stellar mass plus gas mass of a galaxy. If you see here, this is a ratio between the mass of globular clusters and the mass of the halo, 
right, uh, uh, as, a f as a function of stellar mass for several decades there. This is work by Mike Hudson and collaborators. And it's flat. It doesn't vary. So it's a very interesting thing. Globular clusters tell us something about galaxy formation. So where does the, how does the Milky Way fare in that uh, situation, in that plot? Right here. Depending upon the mass of the, of the, uh, the dark matter, mass of the, uh, of the, uh, the mass of the dark matter halo, the Milky Way, it could be right dead on the center or off by quite a lot. If it's dead on the center, it tells us one interesting thing. Apparently, galaxies destroyed globular clusters very importantly, which makes globular clusters important contributors to the stellar mass budget of the universe. On the other hand, it may just be telling us again that the Milky Way is weird. Halo. The galactic halo has been known for quite a long time to be composed again of two types of alpha populations, uh, a high one and a low one. The low one is uh, the low alpha population is worked by Nissan and Schuster based on 94 stars. This is, this is what I look like, uh, what I call insightful work. So 94 stars. So there is a low alpha population and a high alpha population. The low alpha population happens to be retrograde motion, whereas the high alpha prograde. Their interpretation as the low alpha population is accretive. Apogee. Apogee studies this in detail. We have lots of, we have thousands of stars in, in the halo that can be used for that. Chris Hayes and collaborators have shown that these stars, these, these, these low alpha stars, they have, uh, um, they have the abundance pattern, low in magnesium, low in aluminum, low in potassium, low in nickel, which is the same as that of satellites of the Milky Way. Then comes Gaia. Comes Gaia, and with Gaia, uh, uh, Amina Helmi and collaborators, and also uh, the Cambridge Group, Cambridge group uh, Belokorov and Dyson, they uh, discover this population in the halo using Sloan, mostly, in Gaia, that has an a, a, a interesting prograde, uh, so retrograde motion. This is, the, this is the real population, and this is the simulated population in this diagram. So they say, well, you know, it's interesting. And they look at Apogee data, say, see that these galaxies, these stars have low alpha. And they propose that this is a single accretion event, that these low ma ma magnesium stars that I was talking to you about before, they, they, they're dominated by a single accretion event, which they call the Gaia Enceladus galaxy, with a progenitor mass of about six times to the eight solar masses. Little did they know that in Liverpool, two days after uh, uh, the, the release of Gaia DR2, uh, we were on it, and we, we found the, uh, this, so this is the, the magnesium against iron again. This is a cretid halo, high alpha, the thick disk, the thin disk, uh, uh, um, with the grayscale here set to, to represent eccentricity. And uh, um, the, uh, what you see here is the cretid halo is dominated, this population. Two-thirds of it is very high eccentricity, median eccentricity, 0.85. And, the, and the, the rest is like, you know, just a normal distribution. So we find that this high E population has an E. The low E population does not have an E, which again indicates the existence of a coherent uh, 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 stellar uh, uh, chemical evolution. And the metallistia at which it happens is a function of mass, places with a mass roughly around 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. So then we look at what Eagle says about uh, the history of accretion of galaxies in its, uh, in, its, uh, um, in its volume. And what you see here is that so this is a plot of median eccentricity as a function of the redshift of merger, right? The median eccentricity that these, these uh, 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 accreted systems show today, right? So, and, we'll see, and this is the, uh, the line where our galaxy has been uh, uh, located. So what you see here is that uh, First, in order for you to have that kind of eccentricity, you have to have been accreted later. Redshift at, at most 1.5. Second, if you're accreted late, you have a high mass just because of cosmological evolution. However, only three out of 22 Eagle galaxies show this kind of accretion profile. Again, is the Milky Way unusual? Right, so jumping quickly to M dwarfs. So um, M dwarfs are important for reasons that you know. So the, the vast majority of the, uh, the majority of the stellar mass in the galaxy is in the form of M dwarfs. They are, they are important for the search of extrasolar Earths. Uh, uh, Tess and Plato, of course, will discover lots of those, right? Uh, 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 hopefully. And uh, uh, 
APOG has a mass spectra for an astounding 12,000 M dwarfs with that kind of quality that I showed. So uh, this is a, a result uh, recently published by Diogo Soto, Brazilian student from the Observatório Nacional, where uh, uh, this is the, the spectrum synthesis of, of an M dwarf. He has obtained, check out the temperature, the, the log G, and the, the abundance that he was able to obtain. Uh, uh, now multiply that by 12,000. Finally, none of this would have been possible without ASPCAP, the, the uh, um, Apple G stellar parameter and the chemical abundances pipeline. Take a look at this spectrum fit. In order to obtain a spectrum fit like this, where you can only tell observation from synthesis because uh, of the bad pixels, you have to have good model atmospheres, you have to have a good line list, you have to have a good spectrum synthesis code, and you have to have great data. The spectroscopists here know that this is just the beginning. Once you get a fit like that, that's when the hard, hard work starts. Because of all the well-known uh, uh, degeneracies in, in spectra of anything, right? So um, there has been painful work by the ASPCAP team guided by a relentless uh, uh, drive to get better and better parameters. So I'll finish this with this movie, which uh, doesn't play here, but... Uh, oh, it was going. Oh, dumb. Which shows the evolution of the stellar parameters in ASPCAP, data release after data release. And this is getting better, okay? Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. Okay, we have time for questions. I see one right here. Please state your name and your affiliation. Hi, um, I am Antonella Vallenari from INAF Padova. Thank you, Ricardo, for this very interesting talk. Really good job. And uh, my question is the following. In the Eagle simulation, uh, um, if you look uh, at the standard galaxies, you see that uh, the thick disk is an ubiquitous uh, feature that you find in almost all the galaxies. But you seem to think that the Milky Way is peculiar from uh, a chemical point of view concerning the thick disk. So what is in the Eagle simulation uh, the dominant mechanism of, disk for, of thick disk formation? And uh, does this simulation uh, account for migration, for instance? Okay. This is a fascinating question and a very difficult one, but I'll try my best. So first and foremost, Eagle does not have the ability to distinguish it, the simulation that we adopted to distinguish thick from thin disk. You can distinguish high alpha from low alpha. Now, the Milky Way undergoes this interesting uh, uh, phenomenon where there doesn't seem to be a, dis a structural distinction between the thick and the thin disk, but there's a chemical one. And uh, uh, it's only after we, we are able to model this uh, uh, in the spatial resolution that is required that we'll be able to address that. Currently, my thinking is that the thick disk is this major accretion event that we are talking about and that formed the thick disk. The high alpha of the thick disk, my view as a non-theorist, is the following. You only generate high alpha in pressure-supported massive systems. You don't generate high alpha in disks. Therefore, the thick disk is not a disk. I'm not a theorist, so I can say those things. Okay, do we have more questions for Ricardo? I see one right over here, Serge. Hi, Serge Dietrich from Carnegie. Uh, this is great to see this. It's also really fun to watch Apogee at Las Campanas Observatory. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your target selection and data qualities, uh, especially in the sense of M dwarfs, they're the most numerous but they're also the most likely to get contaminated because they're the faintest ones. So how do you deal with that? But contamination by, uh, uh, by what exactly? 
by crowded fields and other right, right, fields right, right. companions. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, th there's a number of things there. So number one, uh, thankfully, M dwarfs don't happen in crowded fields because they are nearby, and uh, usually you can you can avoid uh, the crowded fields. Now, that said, uh, uh, we have a fairly good uh, uh, data reduction pipeline that does forward modeling and accounts for the, the interfiber contamination. On top of that, what we do, in order, because we have very good control of just how much light uh, goes from one fiber to the next, we impose a fiber uh, 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 management system where there is a maximum magnitude difference between adjacent fibers. Therefore, you never have a very uh, a bright star near a very faint one. More questions for Ricardo? I have a question. So we're very interested in the work that Apogee is doing on M dwarf stars. We would like to invert the process and use the abundances to estimate the ages of M dwarfs because it's very hard to get ages to right. calibrate gyrochronology, look at planet evolution. But given that we have all these populations of stars mixing in the solar neighborhood, I was wondering if you could comment on whether you think that's an enterprise that, 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 that will work. And it's not just my group, but also Ian Crossfield's group from MIT is working on this as well. They're also at this meeting. It's a difficult problem. I, I think that, uh, um, so we, when you look, so the problem is that you know, when you look at the, at the giant population, or in fact any population for which you do have ages in chemistry, uh, 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 you are affected by the fact that your sample is usually solar neighborhood and, and there is uh, uh, radio mixing that prevents you from really telling uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 pretty much like, you know, makes a relationship very uh, uh, scattered. Which is another way to say that your relationship between chemistry and, and age is mediated by star formation efficiency, right? And therefore, uh, if you don't know that, you cannot use age, uh, chemistry to, to convert into age. Tough. Hard problems are always the good ones, though. So. Okay, I think we should move on, so let's all thank Ricardo again for that fantastic talk.